Hey everyone, Jason Curtis, horse show announcer here again. Today, Welcome to the Barn goes on a road trip where we are heading to North Fort Myers, Florida and Sable Row Farm. We are talking to Michelle Gerlock with an in-depth discussion of the half halt and several other related topics. Michelle has been a professional dressage instructor and trainer for 25 years. She has also been through the USDF L program and earned a USDF University Bronze Diploma. Michelle has also earned her USDF Bronze, Silver, and Gold medals. She takes weekly lessons with author and previous USET team member Kathy Connolly. In the summers, she takes monthly clinics with senior judge Sue Madden Mandis. Michelle has developed a methodology for teaching that includes not only the hows, but also the whys, using biomechanics, diagrams in the sand, and occasionally her own body. Michelle thoroughly explains movement, half faults, collection, and seat position to her students. Welcome to the barn. Michelle, I've seen you certainly at Gold Coast Dressage Association at the GMO in Wellington. Likewise at Wellington Classic Dressage. I've announced you at both of those. I've announced you at the Region 3 Championships in Wellington when it was at the Jim Brandon Equestrian Center and at Global. And, of course, at Foxley Farm, which is an hour and a half up the road from where we are today. As a dressage rider, a lot of people don't start here in dressage. Where did you first put foot to leather on a saddle? I was five. And my mother's best friend moved in next door and said, we're getting a divorce and I'm going to do something fun with my daughter. Does your daughter want to go? And my mom said, of course she wants to go. So she dragged these two five-year-old little girls off for their first lessons. And that's what we did. Started out in the hunter jumper world at age five. And my friends have since stopped riding and I have continued on over the course of the years up to and including some Western gaming sorts of things, as well as riding three and five gated saddle horses, all before finding my way into a dressage saddle. What put you into the deep seat of a dressage saddle? What what was the original thing that said, that's what I'm going to do? Well, I made it there the way a fair amount of dressage riders do, and that was that I had a horse that didn't want to jump. So clearly, that means that you have to do dressage. And that was my way of thinking at the time. Uh, you know, well, if I can't jump, then I'll be able to do dressage. And somewhere along the line, I realized that those two statements didn't match at all. And dressage was a wonderful sport of the mental and physical development of the horse and rider and a partnership that was a long time in development. And the intricacies of the sport just won me over. And although my initial coming to dressage, so to speak, was somewhat unceremonious, my progression through the journey has taught me so much more about it and given me such a greater respect for it and the people who do it well. When you started riding in dressage, I know you have your USDF bronze, silver, and gold medals. You have your L judge's card. Through the experience of the L program specifically, what was that experience like? And was that something you'd recommend to other riders? Well, interestingly enough, I did not complete it. I, I did the whole thing, but I did not full-on test to become an L graduate. And the reason I didn't is because while we, through the middle of the testing, I realized the importance of the program. The program is outstanding. If you want to learn biomechanics, you want to learn to develop your eye, you want, it is an outstanding program to be in. But the other thing I learned was that I don't have the wherewithal to be an excellent judge. Excellent judges have the exact same focus from the first ride of the day through the last ride of the day. And what I learned in the program was I have that sort of focus to be a trainer and an instructor, but not a judge. And I have the utmost respects for somebody that can sit behind C for eight hours and see only what's in the arena in front of them. And that was a difficult thing for me. That was what I learned is that it taught me a huge amount. Outstanding program. Cannot say enough about it. But I just learned that that was not for me. I needed to be, I needed to be the coach, not the judge. As a trainer, 
oftentimes people have questions, hey, how do I do this or how do I do that? And oftentimes, even in the jumper world, half halt, half halt. Well, what are the basics of a half halt? I mean, really, from a trainer's perspective, from a rider, I know what I'm doing. But when you're on the ground, how do you teach someone actually how to do a half halt? Well, you have to think about it. For me, I think about it in terms of how to teach somebody how to drive stick shift. It's a feeling. Okay, so you tell somebody, well, you're going to let off the clutch until you feel it engage, and then you're going to give it gas. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds awesome. Well, I'll just do that. P-p-p-p-p-p. And the car dies. Okay, so you have to teach from a standpoint that you're initially, you have to tell the rider, I'm trying to teach you a feel, but the first thing I need to teach you is what each of the components feels like. I can't ultimately teach you what it feels like when the clutch engages until you kill the car 15 times. Then all of a sudden you're going to know about where that is. And then, of course, once you figure it out in your Honda, then we're going to drive a Ferrari and it's going to be completely different anyway. So what I like to do is think about what of the four components are involved in a half halt and what the aids are for those four components. The four components of a half halt are forward, back, if you will, or contain the energy, soften, and ride forward again. So parts one and parts four are the same. And part two is a containment of the energy, and part three is a release of the energy. So you have to know what each of those four things feel like before, individually, before you can put them together and make what would be a half halt that the horse would understand. And of course, remembering that the horses don't think like we do. We have to take each piece for what it is. So forward, to me, means one of three things. Forward as ground cover, forward as light to the leg, meaning that the horse thinks forward when you use your leg. And the third way a horse can go forward is forward in the direction of the hind leg, but that's more specific towards collection and not necessarily a half halt. So let's just talk about forward over the ground sure. in pertaining to your half halt. So you ask your horse to go forward, and that's quite simple. It's a, it's a leg aid. If I put my leg on, does my horse go forward? If the answer is yes, part one of the half halt is already in there. Part number two is, does my horse stop when I use the reins? And of course, we're talking about these aids. Remember, we're isolating the difference between feeling that clutch engage and adding gas. So I've got to know that each of these parts works by itself. So if I sell my horse in the absence of all other aids, go forward from my leg, does he go? Part number two, in the absence of all other aids, if I close my rein, does my horse stop? Part number three is soften off again, because now I have to open the door back so that part number four, ride forward again, can come through. That's a half halt. All the other fancy stuff that people say and all the other fluff that goes along with it is how to take those four components. I always talk about this as being, when you first learn, we're riding a half halt on a football field. I'm going forward. I'm stopping. I'm giving. I'm going. I've just covered a football field. Now we have to take those four parts and we have to put them together on a ping pong table that a mouse could play on. Okay, so that becomes timing and feeling, but you're not going to learn until you can do it on a football field. Go, stop, give, go. That's the simplest way I've ever heard that explained. I mean, I, I truly, that's, that's like... Well, I'm a simple kind of girl. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I've never heard it explained quite that way and so simply and so succinct. So when you're going... From forward to a stop, back to the forward and letting it go again. At some point, you need to go more forward, less forward. What, what is it meant by more forward? I think that more forward is probably the most misinterpreted directives ever given by an instructor. Because most people receiving that instruction think that they have to add ground cover. So that all of a sudden, somebody hears more forward and somebody just hits the gas. They absolutely want to go. Well, that's not always the case. As I talked about before, forward is either ground cover, forward light to the leg, the horse's mental way of thinking, 
or forward in the direction of the hind leg. So without knowing specifically when you ask me for more, then most riders just would simply ride more ground cover. And sometimes more ground cover isn't the answer. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it is. But not always. Because if you get more ground cover with more speed, and I'm going to define speed as RPM, because right. obviously if you have more ground cover, you have more miles per hour. But miles per hour and RPM aren't always the same. So when I say more forward, I always ask for activity, meaning I want amplitude in the horse's way of going versus ground cover. So, but when you're specifically talking about it in reference to a half halt, I like to think about more forward as meaning more towards the bit. So let's go back to our four parts again and how to take it from a football field to a ping pong table. If I say to my horse, go forward, ground cover, and I say stop from the rain, when I give the amount of forward that my horse should go is exactly the amount of forward that I just gave. Okay? So that means that if I say go, stop, go, and I put my hand forward six inches, my horse should come six inches forward to the bit. If I put my hand forward six millimeters, my horse goes six millimeters forward to the bit. If I'm riding a training level horse, my horse may need six centimeters. When Laura Graves does it so beautifully on Verdades, she gives forward one millimeter and he goes exactly one millimeter to the bit, no more, no less, stays light, and that's exactly the space that he filled, was it what she gave, which is where your half halt, your balance comes from. So forward, back, give, now we have to be specific, forward to the end of the give. Obviously, you know what you're talking about, and you've taught a lot of people how to do this. Those of you listening that may be equitation riders, when the judge asks for an extension of stride, they're not asking for a faster stride. They're asking for a larger stride. And often when you say, extend your canter, that doesn't mean go faster. It means go bigger. And that's what I think a lot of people, although they might understand that concept, I think the way you just described it will help them right. understand what that covering the ground is as opposed to RPM and faster. Can I give you another example? Please. Okay. So another example to that RPM versus miles per hour is we have, let's use Verdades again, because he's such a lovely example and he's American, so we love him. If Verdades was going... And I'm just making up a number. This absolutely means nothing. This is a random number. If Verdades is going 10 miles an hour in passage down the long side of the arena and a mini is going exactly 10 miles an hour next to him, they're nose to nose. They're absolutely going to cross the finish line at the same time. That mini has more RPM than Verdades does. And yet, Verdades is the one with the impulsion, the expression, the whatever. That pony's going 10 miles an hour, or that mini's going 10 miles an hour, but not near the quality, expression, throughness, all the other things that the other horse has in the purest form of a good half halt. Sure. And that's, that's the difference between RPM and miles per hour. And that's why the terminology of forward and speed, so when somebody says go faster, not helpful, Go more forward, not helpful. More forward ground cover, more forward amplitude. More speed miles per hour, more speed RPM. These are things that people should ask when somebody, an instructor, we get so wrapped up in the moment, we say more forward. And then they, I don't know. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You can pause to ask. Please right. ask. We talked about giving the, the six millimeters or the six inches or the one millimeter, what is good contact? Good contact is exactly what you need to recycle the energy through a horse's body. And I know that that's vague, so I'm going to help you with that. If you have a horse that's doing training level, that horse is going to be his energy ring, if you will, because remember, that's what a half halt does. A half halt takes energy and moves it through the horse's body. So once again, Back to my football field, forward, back, give, go. If you're in a training level horse, your horse is moving in an ellipse. 
So good contact for him is whatever the front end of that ellipse catches and recycles back to the hind end. Okay. As a horse gets more and more through and connected, he's going to start to look more like a circle. So that's a little bit going to change where your good contact is. Okay. So I can't exactly describe where that needs to be. I can tell you what the qualities of good contact are so that you know what you have. Good contact should be symmetrical. And that means both in weight and position of the hands. Good contact should be elastic, meaning that there's a positive tension to it. So that if my hand, if the horse draws forward a little bit, my hand can follow. Or if I draw back a little bit, the horse would follow. So that if I float the reins at the horse, you know, people like, oh, look how light my horse is. And they float the reins and the reins just drop into a loop and the horse doesn't move. Well, that's not good contact either because now he's just in this place. So it's symmetrical, elastic, and consistent. The consistency of a contact is good. You can't have a conversation if there's not a consistent line of communication. So symmetrical, elastic, and consistent, the contact. Where do we find the lightness in all that that was just described going all the way back to our example of the half halt? I often see in the judge's sheets, the judge's comments, needs to be lighter. From, from a standpoint of not being a competitive dressage rider, when I'm reading that or the, the reading me a test, what does that mean? Lightness is kind of an interesting thing. It's another one of those, like, forward, okay? So when I see that in a judge's comment, my question to the judge would be, tell me what kind of lightness that you want. Because lightness is not a function of weight. Lightness is a function of self-carriage. So to me, that should be defined by a horse's level of training. Making this umbrella statement that a horse should never be heavy and dragging you around. If a horse goes past, back to the football field, forward, back, give, go. And I said, if you give, wherever you give, the horse should go out to that place, but not beyond it. When they go beyond where you gave, that's when it starts to look like the horse is dragging you around. The question is, why did he go beyond where I gave? Well, most likely because he fell out of the balance that you just put him in when you said, go forward, come back. Now I gave. Now it's your job to come only to this place that I gave you to. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Okay. So now when you talk about the definition of lightness, that means that when you give and the horse goes past where you gave, you have to start over. You have to go all the way back. Now I got to go back again. Okay. Because remember, here's the nifty part. Since phase one and phase four are the same, if when you give on part three and they go past you, you're already part one again. You're ready to start over. So you can come right back. And then I can give. And you can go to that place. If you go beyond it, yep, back again we go. So that this way, there's a very clear understanding of the horse. We, all this stuff, okay, for those of you who aren't sure, although I've welcomed you all into my barn, I've got notes in front of me. And with these notes, speaks to the complexity that humans think. Horses don't think like that. My horse does not take notes. He doesn't consider his lesson when he's out grazing. He's not worried at all that he went past the balance box, you know, in the last test and that the judge said he needed to be lighter. He's eaten his carrots and, you know, he's perfectly fine after his shower. So that means that it's my responsibility to make sure that he understands in the simplest terms that he can. So if he wants to stop being told, come back, then he's going to stop going past the front of that box. As long as I explain it to him the same every day with no emotion or no thought that he cares that I just told him that 15 times. He doesn't. 
He doesn't care. He only cares that you're happy and he's doing the very best that he can and that you appreciate that. If you want something different, then it's your job to explain it to him. And it's your job to explain it to him in a way that he understands so that he can give it back to you. Does that make sense? It does. And it's one of those weird conflicts. You see writers have temper tantrums sometimes. They're upset about something that either they did or the horse did during the test. My personal belief is if you're not ready to take the test, then don't take the test. You you can't train like you can't train a two foot jumper to jump two foot at the show in a warm up ring when you're supposed to be jumping that in competition in two minutes. The purpose of the warm up ring is to warm up. It's Absolutely. not to teach the horse how to do what you want to do. Without a doubt. Whether it's dressage or jumpers. So when we see that happening in the warm up ring and people giving a lesson. I understand making little last minute adjustments. Hey, we talked about this yesterday. You know, get, get your elbow in, drop your ankle a little bit more, drop your heel a little more. Those are last minute things we all kind of forget about. Trying to get that horse to a perfect spot or to a perfect release and get that six millimeters. You're not going to teach that in that warm-up ring. No. And you know what? My opinion on that is that competition never increases training. It diminishes it because Competition is the place for competition cover-up. Training is not the place for competition cover-up. At home, if my horse goes past the balance box, I will correct him. If that means 15 times down the long side, I have to correct him. I will correct him 15 times down the long side. In competition, if my horse goes past the balance box, I smile and I give him a little bit stronger half off. And I hope that the judge doesn't write horse should be lighter at the bottom of the test. But I'm thinking to myself all along, I said, I cannot wait to get back home again because you're going to do 15 half falls down the long side because you are not dragging me around anymore. Having said that, there is no place, no place ever. You can be sad. You can cry in the truck. That's perfectly fine. But there is no place ever for a temper tantrum on horseback, ever. And I'm sorry, I do not know who to credit this quote, but it hangs in my tack room and it says that. Anger begins where knowledge ends. People get angry because they don't know the answer. So anytime I find my temper rising, I always have to go back to simple. Once again, humans think in complex terms, horses do not. So if I've gone past where my brain can impart knowledge to my horse, in a way that he understands because my knowledge has ended, then I need to slow down and go back to something that's very basic. But pertaining to the horse shows, you should never compete at your horse's stretch. You should always compete in your horse's comfort zone because then showing is fun. Showing is not fun when you're showing at the horse's stretch. And may I just give you a quick little tip? Sure. For horse showing as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. If you look at a test and you think to yourself, I've got one trouble spot in that test, one, one trouble spot, this don't school it to death in the warm up ring. All it does is frustrate you and your horse. If you've got one trouble spot, I wouldn't do it at all. Maybe once. If it doesn't go well, leave it alone. It's one mark, one box. That's right. it. Now, I'm not suggesting that you don't go home and fix that, but you're not going to fix it at the horse show. And this is what you were talking about before. And since you know you're not going to fix it at the horse show, why don't you concentrate on the places where you can put a seven or an eight in the box and not worry about the one where you're going to get a known four? Do the math. Right. right. Okay. If you can do several seven or eights, then you're going to compensate for that. And what are you going to do? Make the four or five? You're not going to make it an eight today. It's kind of like when at home. Let's say you're schooling pre Saint George, but you're showing at third level, or maybe you're showing fourth one. You might school at home pre Saint George. That doesn't mean you're ready for that test of pre Saint George. Mm -hmm. So we might have some of these skills learned, but we're not ready to demonstrate everything, like you say, to a six, seven, or possibly an eight. Right. And I think the way people should learn that, how, how that goes. Okay. So you're showing third level, you're schooling Saint George at home. Ask yourself, because really, when you think about it, there's not a lot different from third level to pre-St. George. There really isn't. You add tempies, okay, fair enough, but they're still just flying changes. You add half pirouettes, but you're already doing ultra-collect 
and a give off the inside rain at third level and fourth level, fair enough. These are all things that you know. The question mark is, how long does it take you to prepare it? And what you need to learn about the pre-St. George is what the connective tissue is. So the connective tissue in a third level test is much longer than the connective tissue in a pre-St. George test. And in the pre-St. George test, it's much longer than the connective tissue in a Grand Prix test. And if you can't accomplish the next movement with the allotted amount of connective tissue, then you're not ready. Well, it's kind of like going back to your football and ping pong, you know, oh, your yes. football field and your ping pong table, because it's, okay, I'm going to need three strides to do this, where in a pre-St. George or a Grand Prix test, you've got half a stride to do this. And that's where that, that difference in learning might be. Absolutely. There's lots of jargon out there, and whether it's the hunter-jumper world, dressage world, and I'm sure in the quarter horses and Appaloosas and everything else, that a lot of people just don't, they hear it, but they don't know exactly what they mean. For example, falling down neck. What is that? Yes. You want, people talk about the horse going out, out to the bit, out to the bit, out to the bit. And then we talk about how we want the horse, horse's neck to fall out to the bit. Okay, well, then that's how the horse looks and stays relaxed through the top line. We all know what it looks like when it's right. But what it is in its actuality is, if you would indulge me, let's stack dominoes, okay? And you know how everybody makes all these beautiful domino things, and then we, everybody loves tipping that one domino, and we just get to watch the whole thing go. All right, well, I'm going to put dominoes up the shape of a horse's neck, okay? And then I'm going to, as they're stacked up the neck, I'm going to start the bottom one and it's going to tip, 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 knock all those over. And then the one at the very top is going to fall over the edge. Then I'm going to catch it with the bit. That's the best way I can think of to determine where I want my horse's neck, how I want it to feel. Now pretend I'm not catching it with the bit. Let's pretend I'm catching it with a bucket of water. Okay. Where do I want to catch it? Do I want to catch it down low? Is my horse doing a first level reachy chewy circle? Or do I want to catch it up high? My horse is doing pee off. The feeling of the neck falling into your hand is the same. That image of the dominoes going up and then tipping over at the end and then landing into your hand, into the bit. That's the feeling of the falling down neck. Now you just have to decide where you want to catch it. Do you want to catch it high or do you want to catch it low? And when you catch it, remember that that domino only falls in a straight line, which is what keeps the horse on the vertical. Okay, are you all picturing this? I hope so. Because that domino would never come backwards towards the horse's chest. It can't. Gravity pulls it down straight. So if your stretchy circle in first level brings your horse's nose behind the vertical, then we already know he doesn't have a falling down neck. The energy got displaced somewhere. It got pushed somewhere. It stopped going forward towards the bit because that domino always falls in a straight line. Okay, now this is something that I struggle with. And I'm still a very green rider, and I will always be a green rider when it comes to dressage. How do you know if your horse is in front of the bit? behind the bit or really on the bit from the seat where you're sitting and you're looking at these ears and you're looking at your bridle works, what is the best way you can describe how to see is your horse forward or behind? That's so interesting that you say that, that you ask that question because I think that that's the dressage disease, okay? Because there isn't a person, a person that rides dressage that cannot, could not describe to you in perfect detail the crown piece of their bridle and the horse's ears, and exactly how they intersect. We all know. We know exactly what it looks like because we stare at it all the time. But really, that's where your ground person is going to come into play for you. Because if, you're, if that's what you're accustomed to looking at, and let me just pause to say, parenthetically here, we should all be looking up. We should be. We should right. all be looking up, yeah. and you should only glance down to check this, okay? Which does not, by the way, glance down does not involve your chin. If your chin gets closer to your chest, you're looking down. If your chin stays up, then you're glanced down with your eyes and that's acceptable. All right. So a ground person tells you when you're on the vertical. 
And then it's your job to commit to memory what that looks like. In most cases, not all, but in most cases, that involves being able to see the bit of forelock that is directly in front of the crown piece of your bridle. Okay. If that bit of forelock and or the front of your crown piece start to angle downward, then most likely your horse has gone behind the vertical. Now, I want to be very careful to say that behind the bit and behind the vertical are not the same thing. A horse can be behind the vertical and not be behind the bit. And a horse can be in front of the vertical and not be in front of the bit. Weight in the reins, throughness of the back, which is the softness and the elasticity there, your ability to recycle the energy. Is the horse staying on the six millimeters or six centimeters or one millimeter that I gave it? Okay, those are the questions that you have to ask. That's the feel part. That's the clutch gas pedal thing. But the vision from the saddle usually means that little bit of forelock that's just in front of the crown piece you should be able to see. And if it disappears, most likely you've gone behind the vertical. I okay. can't speak to behind the bit. People always want to tell me, Michelle, you should get yourself videoed. Get yourself videoed. Get yourself videoed. But see, that's not what I see. A GoPro to me is the most helpful thing. If I had a GoPro while I was taking a lesson, because that's my perspective. When I envision my test, I envision my test with my horse's ears in front of me. I don't envision my test like I'm watching it from the outside. So the reason I suggest a ground help or mirror is because what you need is that feedback at that instant moment, okay? And then once you have that in your vision, then that's where you can apply it so that when you're riding through the course of your test and you do your glance down, glance down does not include chin. When you glance down, you can say, I'm right where I need to be, or oops, I need to ride, I need to push that six millimeters out there a little bit so that I can see that bit of forelock. But that's really where your ground help or your mirror would make the synapse, if you will, the connection for right. your vision and what is correct. How does a rider know when the answer from the horse was good enough? Oh, now that's, that's very interesting because I personally, as a rider, like a time bomb beneath me. I want that a, a mistake from my leg says, do something. If I move my leg, my horse ought to be going, oh, mom said something. Uh-oh, what was I supposed to do? I think I might have missed something. That's how I want them to think. Most adult amateurs, which statistically, in case you didn't know this, 65% of the USDF membership, roughly, is an adult amateur female between the ages of 35 and 55. So I feel pretty comfortable when I say most riders don't want that sort of electricity. They want to be able to make a mistake with their leg. So most times it's up to the rider to determine what's good enough. So what's in front of the leg for me might be scary for somebody else. Having said that, while you are making those decisions on what's good enough, you're setting a standard for your horse that he has to learn to operate in. So when you say to me that I've decided that this is good enough, and then two weeks from now, maybe that's not good enough and you want me to get on your horse and make him a little sharper, make him a little this, then I'm going to bring what's good enough up just a little bit, okay? So that we always have a standard that's a little bit changing on what's good enough. And then your job is to then make that your standard as what's good enough. What's important and I know you're, you're, I see the thinking face going on right there. What's important is that that standard only goes up and then stays up. Then you can, then your expectation of your horse will be proper. If you make me raise it and you drop it down and I come back and raise it and then you drop it down, then this horse cannot possibly learn or progress. He's going to be frustrated. He's not going to know the answers to things. And then pretty soon your aids don't mean anything because he's going to say it changes all the time. So I don't know what to do. So when you decide what's good enough and make no mistake, again, that's the rider's decision. When you're going shoulder in and yesterday your shoulder in only came 25 degrees and you got off, you set the standard for what was good enough that day. Okay. 
Well, today, if you make it 20 degrees, which by the way, still is not good enough for competition, you've varied the standard. How can he learn? So to me, if I said today is good enough at 25 degrees, tomorrow's going to be good enough at 26. And a week from now, it's going to be the 30 degrees that I'm expected to have in competition. And then guess what? I'm going to want 31 degrees or 32 degrees and settle back to 30. Because remember I said before, competition doesn't ever increase training. Competition diminishes training. So if I can't regularly get 32 degrees at home with proper bend, that I know that when I get to the competition, my horse is going to steal that extra two degrees, then I'm not ready to show shoulder in. So good enough is a standard that's always given by the rider and should always be something that we're raising, not raise lower, raise lower, because then we can't expect our horses to learn. When we look at a horse out in a pasture, you know, we see it in its natural state and natural wonder, if you will. We can see it do, we'll even see sometimes our horses, they'll do an amazing extended trot just because they're out there playing. This is a natural thing for them to do. We then will see them do things that some people would say, if a person was on that back like Roll Kerr, if they tuck in and, and just touch their chest with their chin, oh my God, that's Roll Kerr, but they do it in nature. What I'm kind of getting at is when we see what they're doing out there, but then we want to bring all that if you will, the confirmation, the balance, and all that strength all into one thing. How do we know the confirmation balance that we're looking for? Well, you know, it's interesting. You, let me just talk about what the horses do in nature for a moment because everybody says, well, dressage is all natural. They only do in dressage what they do in nature. Well, true, except for my horses on a regular basis, eat hay, eat grain, eat grass, and make a mess of their stalls. They drink water and they make a mess of their stalls. And they play, less so as they get older, but they play or they run when a puma lands on their back. All of those things involve an adrenaline surge. So we're asking our horses to do what they do in nature with a surge of adrenaline. We want them to do it without the surge of adrenaline. We want them to do it on an aid and look relaxed. So guess what, folks? That's not natural. Horses do not passage relaxed in nature. Horses passage in nature when they're playing or when they're being chased by something or when they've bucked somebody off and they're going flying back to the barn with their tail up over their back. But that includes adrenaline. Once you take away the surge of adrenaline and you want relaxation, then the nature part goes out of it because horses don't do that naturally. Now. It is a movement they are capable of doing in nature, but it's not how they would do it naturally. So saying that, what you're really looking for is a horse that is predisposed confirmationally to be able to do these things with relaxation. So then you start talking about all of the, you know, the things that people much more learned than myself speak of in sport horse seminars, you know, the angle of the croup, the angle of the stifle the length of the cannon bones, the size of the mouth, the adjustment, you know, behind the jowls and so on and so forth. But I think at the end of the day, what you're really looking for is you're looking for an overall picture of athleticism. And I think after that, the little nuances of imperfections, if you will, are going to be glazed over by proper training, desire on the horse's part, you know, that's not Every perfect horse has gone to Grand Prix and not every imperfect horse got stuck at training level. We're going to change directions just for a minute and step away from the horse and let's concentrate on the rider. Earlier, you said most riders are your adult amateurs. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about fitness for a minute. Many of these adult amateurs work five days a week. Some work three days a week. Some are lucky enough to be stay-at-home moms or are financially stable enough to where they don't have to work at all. Mm -hmm. So certainly we see a wide range of riders. Yana Rumbaugh is mm -hmm. an amateur rider. Yes. She's a very excellent amateur rider. She is. She rides every day of the week. She does. Most adult amateurs, I would assume, and this is an assumption on my part, I apologize, everybody, don't have that luxury. So how do they keep fit enough to do all these demanding things that we're asking them to do when they come to you on a Saturday or Sunday? 
or Thursday afternoon when they're getting ready for a show that weekend? Well, I think people need to realize when I consider rider fitness, I have to also remember that they usually what happens is they're asking me pertaining to something regarding their horse, you know, my horse and his fitness level and whatever to go through the horse show. And I always think to myself, well, your fitness involves that too, because consider what you need to do to go to a horse show. You need to be fit enough to arrive at the horse show, unload your things, set up your things, ride your horse. Usually people take a lesson on Friday beforehand, put everything away, go to bed, get up the next morning, feed your horse, do your stall, which a lot of these people don't, don't do if you board. Okay. But at a horse show, they're cleaning their own stalls and they're braiding and not always, but a, but a fair amount of the time, these people are kind of do it yourselfers. So you need to have a fitness level that allows enough energy in you to, after you do those things that you're not accustomed to doing on a regular basis, to still be able to ride well once you get in, once you get into the ring. So that's a question that you need to ask yourself. Am I fit enough to do these things and still be the rider that my horse needs me to be for the duration of a test and then be able to put my horse away and do all those things afterwards? So if you're thinking about your horse's fitness level to go to a horse show, then you need to think about what your fitness level needs to be for that. So you've got your rider who works five days a week and they can get in time to ride their horse, but they don't have a lot of time besides that. It does not take a huge amount of time to do crunches. I don't always recommend sit-ups because if your back is bothering you or whatever, you have to be careful, but to do crunches, to do what I call isometric core exercises, which would be plank sorts of exercises, you know, anything that requires stability because it's your stability that makes the biggest difference. Your rider fitness to me is about your ability to stay independent of what your horse is doing. Because if your horse doesn't pull very hard and can snatch you out of the tack, then it's going to be very difficult for you to take your football field size half halt and make it into that miniature ping pong table that we talked about. But if your ability to stay independent of your horse, if you're fit enough, for me, that's where strength is defined. You know, people say, well, you know, Michelle, you're a strong girl. Well, yeah, I'm a strong girl. I'm a strong girl because I actually do go to the gym five days a week because I like it. And I want to be stronger, but I don't want to ride with strength. I want to ride with independence. And in order to be independent, you have to be stable. And stability is a certain amount of strength and fitness. When you talk about stability on a horse, I go back to Lunch lessons. Mm -hmm. Take away the reins, take away the irons, and do three months, four months of just lunge lessons so you get that stability. You get that independent seat. Some people think I'm crazy. I mean, it's just something that I think everyone should, in my opinion, and it's my opinion, spend time a couple weeks a year on the end of, end of a lunch line. Because if you're not, like you say, hitting the gym five days a week, or if you're not competing on a regular basis, how else do you keep that independent seat and that stability, if you will, and that body core strength? Am I crazy in the idea of lunge lessons? I think lunge lessons are absolutely great. I, there's, there's no doubt about it. And you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because so many, so many aspects come into making somebody a good rider. And oftentimes we get focused in how to go up the levels. And when you're on your way up the level, you're starting, if you could picture going up the levels instead of being a linear progression, think about going up the levels as being a pyramid. And at the bottom, you've got so much to learn to build your foundation that anything that you do in that lower level that's so wide is going to help you get to the top. So don't misunderstand it, it because Again, I'm just going to take this pyramid and make it 10 bricks across at the bottom just for a picture, okay? One of those bricks is a stable independent seat. Without a stable independent, throw that brick away. You don't want to do that one? No problem. You don't have to do it. Because another one of those bricks is forward light to the leg. Throw that one away too. You don't want to work on that. I don't want to work on forward light to the leg today. Forget it. There's still eight bricks. Okay. Certainly when we get down to six bricks, those two on the corners won't matter. They're unimportant, right? Well, if you take away enough bricks off the bottom, 
then you've got no hope of stacking six, the next layer of six bricks. Okay. And then guess what, folks? When you get to the one that you think you need to work on, you've got nowhere to put it. None. So you can't throw away the bricks in the bottom. So if lunge lessons help you, take them. Absolutely take them because they're part of your foundation. Another suggestion for an independent seat is, and they sell them at Walmart, I believe, those big balance balls, go buy one. Go buy one. And you tell me you can sit on one in the living room without it rolling out from underneath you. Because if you can't, that thing doesn't have a mind. And if you can't sit on that balance ball in the living room and watch television, then your core is not stable enough. And it certainly isn't stable enough to sit the trot. If you can't sit on a ball that doesn't have an opinion and isn't moving, it only moves because you move. If you sit in the center of it, it's going to stay put. And you know what? For those of you who are really interested, find a YouTube video of Gunter Seidel. He, I can only do it on the half ball that's got the stable at the bottom. I don't know if any of you can know what these look like. They call it a BOSU. It's flat on the bottom and it looks like half of a balance ball. And I can kneel on that and hold reins and people can move around and they can't move me. Gunter does it in a video on a whole ball. It's not flat on the bottom. That man kneels on it and they've got these battle ropes and they're twirling these battle ropes and moving back and forth and he does not budge. That kind of core stability is amazing and that's why he is the rider that he is. And most of us, and I know that we're not going to be, we're not going to be that, but we don't need to be. If you can't sit on the ball, then you can't sit independent on the horse. Talk to us about balance before brilliance. What oh. is that? Well, first of all, I, I absolutely want to say for, for, before we go any further about that, that that is a term, a, a series of words, if you will, balance before brilliance that I have, has been practically tattooed on my forearm by Kathy Connolly. And, and, and Kathy is such an outstanding human being. I just can't even say enough about her. But every time I am riding a horse and I'm thinking to myself, he's got more trot in there. He's got more canter in there. He's got more expression in there. I have to pause and I have to think, is he balanced to ask for more? Is he strong enough to do more? And if the answer is no, then if I ask for more, what I'm going to get is a horse that escapes out the front of the balance box in exchange for something that is false brilliance. So I have to always remember that if my horse is carrying and my horse is light and my horse is right on the balance box and just at the edge of my give go part of the half halt and he stays put, then I can ask for more. Then I can take my nice consistent seven and ask for an eight. Remembering, of course, that the brilliance marks are eight, nine, and 10. Seven is a nice standard for good quality, okay? So then after that, it becomes the brilliance marks. So if I'm going to ride for an eight, I've got to know that I've got a consistent seven before I ride for the eight. And if I don't have a consistent seven or I'm stuck somewhere at 6.5, seven-ish, then stay there until you have that consistent seven. Because you know what, folks? It's still a 70% if you put a seven in every box. But that's good training. A seven in every box is a 70% solidly trained horse. You want an 80%? Then that's how you have to find brilliance. But you build it off of a seven in every box. You don't build it off of three fours and three nines. When you're writing a test yourself, do you basically know what score you're going to have at the end? You know, I'd like to say yes, but the answer to that is no. I know what my horse felt like, but we really want to think that they judge to a standard. And I know that the judge in the box is doing their level best to judge what they see. But I also know that I have gotten some of my worst scores for some of my best feeling tests. And I've gotten some of my best scores for some tests that I wish had never been in existence. Right. So I don't, I, 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 I want to be careful saying what, what score, but I know my training. Mm. 
this go- kind of goes back to what I said earlier about not wanting to be a judge, you know, because that's, that's kind of part of the deal. But I know what my training is. Right. I know I have come out of the ring ecstatic and gotten not great scores and come out of the ring where I thought, again, I'm going to go cry in the truck and then won the class. So right. go figure. I, right. I don't know. But I always know where my training is and you should. But I will tell you this, put the score aside. You shouldn't get anything in the comments. That's a surprise. What? He ran through that transition? I had no idea. Did okay. not perform. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. No, I think that you should know the comments. The score is a little more subjective, but you nothing in the comments should surprise you. You know, it's it's always interesting when people come to me and they say, look what she says on my test. She said that I did da-da-da. She said, it's like you say that in every lesson. <laughs> oh, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I said, well, then, then we're right on the money. You know, nothing should be a surprise. What would be a good takeaway from today? What can we kind of circle all this back around to the beginning and say, this is where, this is what your takeaway from today should be. Your takeaway today should be that every horse is capable of doing a proper half halt and staying light. If he understands the four components what each of them means independently in the absence of the other aids that you can then put them together and diminish the length of time that each component takes down to where you can do it in a moment and hold your horse to the same standard on a day-to-day basis that he can come out and perform for you tomorrow. Don't vary the standard. Don't change around the aids and then you'll be able to move forward. Somebody told me just recently that the ability to perform simple things well will allow you to perform complicated things with ease. Michelle, if someone wanted to contact you for a clinic or for a consult, how would they do that? They'd be able to find me on Facebook at Michelle Rosano Gerlach or via my website, sablerowfarm.com. Michelle, I want to take a moment and say thank you very much for inviting us to your place. I'm looking forward to three months, four months down the road when we do this again, and maybe we bring Absolutely in Absolutely, my else. pleasure. Thank you for letting us come to thank your you. barn here at Welcome to the Barn. Thank you, ma'am, very, very much. That was awesome. Appreciate it. If you'd like to be a guest on Welcome to the Barn, please contact me via email, J-A-S-O-N at S-E-E-Y-O-U-A-T-X dot com. That's Jason at cuxx.com or you can find me on Facebook or show announcer The, the ability to not give away points and the, and, and the thought that you, that not only not giving away points, you know, dressage is, I think dressage is a funny sport mm-hmm. because it's the only sport where people would ride an oddly shaped circle. If you were jumping, you wouldn't jump it. You know what I mean? You've got to have a line of travel or you're not going to the center of the jump. In dressage, if they kind of float here or there, people just are like, well, it's okay. Well, no, it's not. If your horse is, and then they don't understand the idea of why the, why a trainer would say your horse is escaping out the outside aids. You know, if the wall catches them all the time. Well, if they were jumping, they'd know that. If your horse escapes through the outside aids and he goes outside that standard, he didn't jump the jump. Right. You know, but <laughs> in dressage, it's a little more foofy than that. And people get stuck in that sort of, um, they get ambivalent about it. You know, as long as they get from point A to point B, they don't care that they traveled, you know, that little blip off the circle. Right. And then, then it costs some points. It costs some points that they don't need to give away. I'm always shocked when I get a test that says 
that the judge was pleased that I wrote accurately. Are you kidding me? It sounds like some of the game is not losing points. If you're looking at it from a, from a, from a zero to a 10, if you know you can write a six, write a six. If you mess up, you get a three or a four or did not complete. Mm-hmm. 